<laughs> the next item of business is a debate on motion 14406 in the name of Elaine Smith on ending austerity, poverty and inequality. Can I can invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. There is no time in hand, so I call on Elaine Smith to speak to and move the motion. Eight minutes, please, Ms Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A few weeks ago, during Challenge Poverty Week, I led a member's debate to consider the work being done in our communities to deal with the consequences of poverty and inequality. In responding to that debate, the Cabinet Secretary remarked that putting forward ideas to challenge poverty, and I quote, should not necessarily come without the appropriate challenge to government and people in power. I agree. So today, Scottish Labour has chosen to use debating time to once again raise the issues of poverty and inequality, to challenge the Scottish Government to use the powers of this Parliament to their full capacity to address poverty and inequality and to end austerity. We know inequality impacts on people's life chances, their life expectancy and their education and employment opportunities. And tomorrow, a report will be published by the HRC, which, according to the Herald, will show that Scotland remains unequal with little improvement over the last three years. We know that women, disabled people and ethnic minorities are all more likely to be living in poverty and that women are less likely to have a job than men and those who do work are likely to earn less. And as inequality increases, so too does the gap between rich and poor. The recent publication of the latest life expectancy figures by the National Records of Scotland must also give us serious cause for concern. This tells us that life expectancy has fallen for the first time in 35 years. The UK figures are amongst the lowest for comparable countries internationally. And within the UK, Scotland has the lowest life expectancy. This trend is completely unacceptable. Further, within the overall Scottish figures, there are great disparities within different local authority areas. For example, there's a variation of more than 10 years, depending on whether you are born in parts of North Lanarkshire or in Perth and Kinross. This is harsh evidence of the growing gap between rich and poor, not just in financial terms, but in general health and how long your life will be. Now, back in 2004, John Swinney, who was then the opposition leader, described the differences in life expectancy as a national scandal and accused Labour of complacency and inaction. In reality, of course, the interventions that Labour were, were making were beginning to close the wealth gap and slowly improve those life expectancy figures. So now it's time for the current SNP government to explain how, under their watch, that progress has stopped. This is today's national scandal, and Labour expects all the powers of the Scottish Parliament to be used to improve life expectancy for all of our citizens. With life expectancy stalling across the UK and the consequences, of, uh, sorry, the consequences of austerity must be placed firmly at the door of those in government. And responsibility, of course, also rests with the UK government. And there is no clearer illustration of their contempt for those in need of a hand than the way in which universal credit has been rolled out across the country. Case after case demonstrates the devastating impact of the punitive way in which universal credit has been introduced. The DWP's own survey of claimants, published in June, showed that nearly half of new universal credit claimants are falling behind with their bills. It has been a disaster for so many already vulnerable households, and Labour would have supported Alec Cole Hamilton's amendment to pause the rollout had it been chosen today. However, my colleague Polly McNeill will be expanding on this in her contribution. Of course, this is not just about material and economic resources, it's also about social relationships, social processes, and the control and exercise of power. Any proper consideration of poverty, inequality, and wealth raises fundamental questions about the organisation of society, its structures, and social justice. The IPPR, Commission on Economic Justice Report, which I mentioned in the previous debate, Prosperity and Justice, a plan for the new economy, addressed that and specifically detailed the belief that a new moral purpose is needed to define the goals of economic policy. The report argues that the economy needs to deliver prosperity and justice together. And that is one good reason why I agree with Alec Johnson's, uh, sorry, Alison Johnson's comment in her unselected amendment that much more must be done to end austerity. As local authorities around Scotland are trying to set budgets and priorities for local services, Audit Scotland reports that council budgets have fallen by 9.6% since 2010-11. In one year alone, 2016-17, our councils have 2,000 
500 fewer workers than they had the year before. Well, quite simply, it's not possible to deliver the services that our families need with a continually reduced workforce. And for households with the least, these services are actually needed the most. Preventing poverty and reducing its impact means investing in our local government provision, not cutting their budgets. And my colleague, Alec Riley, will, will address this issue in more depth. We also know that families in poverty have less money to spend on food, but they spend a greater proportion of their household budget on food than those with higher incomes. And that makes increasing the entitlement of free school meals and it makes initiatives like North Lanarkshire Council's Food 365 to tackle holiday hunger absolutely vital. And it is why Scottish Labour supports an immediate £5 top-up of child benefit. Presiding officer, poverty in a rich country for people means not being able to eat properly and healthily, access school trips or social events, or live in a warm, safe, secure, affordable home. Poverty affects mental health and wellbeing as well as physical. And Shelter Scotland's briefing for this debate reminds us that poor health and homelessness are inextricably linked, with a particularly high rate of admission to mental health services for those in households experiencing homelessness. It is clearly the uneven distribution of wealth, resources and power that allows the rich to grow richer while the poor grow poorer. Working towards redistributing wealth, Labour would make the richest pay their fair share, unlike the Tories who cut the 50 pence tax rate and the SNP who have not reinstated it despite election promises. What we now have is a super wealthy class in our rich country, whilst at the same time, one in four children are growing up in poverty. In the last year, 94 homeless people died on Scotland's streets and life expectancy has fallen for the first time in 35 years. That's since Margaret Thatcher. I have to say, presiding officer, that all politicians should hang their heads in shame when they hear those statistics. Writing in this month's Children in Scotland magazine, John Dickey of CPAG and Peter Kelly of the Poverty Alliance make the point that whilst the Scottish Government's new income supplement is welcome, Urgent action is needed right now as families simply cannot wait. Presiding officer, the reality is to get urgent action, what we need is a Labour government, both here and across the UK, to redistribute wealth, to stop austerity and to eradicate poverty and inequality by implementing policies for the many, not the few. Thank you very much. I now call on Aileen Campbell uh, to speak to him. Oh, I beg your pardon, you didn't move your motion. And I moved the motion and in my name. Deputy <laughs> Presiding Officer should have remembered, ex-Deputy. Uh, I call on Aileen Campbell, Cabinet Secretary, to speak to and move Amendment 14406.4. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And let me start by saying, Presiding Officer, that there is much that I do agree with in what Elaine Smith has said today. It is unacceptable that in what is a rich and prosperous country like Scotland, that there continues to be such persistent and deep-rooted inequalities. And it is right that as a government, we are asked to do all we can to tackle this inequality, not just in the here and now, but to rebalance our economy and to ensure that we deliver lasting and impactful change for years and generations to come. However, what is inescapable is the background against which we seek to do this, because it is against the backdrop of ideologically driven austerity that has impacted on our budget and impacts on our ability to protect those most vulnerable in our society. The UK government's welfare cuts have pushed more and more people into poverty and its impact is devastating. Our own analysis suggests that welfare reforms will reduce social security spending in Scotland by 3.7 billion in 2021. Alarmingly, the target of these reforms have explicitly focused on reducing benefit generosity towards families with children. For example, over the first year of implementation of the two child limit, around 3,800 larger families in Scotland saw their incomes reduced by up to £2,780, a situation only set to worsen year on year. A quarter of people moving from disability living allowance onto PIP were told they do not qualify for support. Because of the decision to reduce universal, universal credit work allowances, each year more and more working people in Scotland are losing out as they move to UC. By 2021, working UC claimants in Scotland are expected to, to lose around £250 million per year in total. The delays in initial payments on top of the lower rates of benefits overall results in more people in rent arrears or reliant on food banks. And that is why the UK government must halt the rollout of universal credit. And the reform, 
benefit, the reform estimated to bring about the biggest reduction in spending in Scotland, around £370 million pounds by 2020-21, is the benefit freeze. Presiding officer, contrary to the Prime Minister's analysis, uh, for the most vulnerable in our society, austerity is far from over. It is hurting people hard and it is penalising them. Lane Smith. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. I certainly don't disagree with it about the cruel approach to the benefit system by the Tories. But this Parliament was supposed to be a buffer against that kind of situation. So perhaps we could hear about what the Scottish Government is going to actually do to tackle poverty and inequality ten years on. I have to call you Cabinet Secretary. As I was going to go on to say, but we, we cannot sit back and allow this to happen, which is why we have acted, acted to mitigate the worst impacts of UK government welfare reform policies. The truth is, however, that unless the UK government reverses reductions in social security spending, then it will be even more challenging for the Scottish government to meet the ambitious targets in the Child Poverty Scotland Act and more generally work towards creating the equal society that we seek. And, presiding officer, where we can take action, we are doing so. Since 2015-16, we have spent nearly £400 million on welfare mitigation. In 2018-19 alone, we'll spend over £125 million on welfare mitigation and measures to help protect those on low incomes, over £20 million more than last year. This includes fully mitigating the bedroom tax and resource for the Scottish Welfare Fund, which has helped 296,000 individual households, a third with children over the past five years. We've given people in Scotland the choice to receive their Universal Credit Award either monthly or twice monthly and to have the housing cost in their Universal Credit Award paid direct to their landlord. Our Child Poverty Scotland Act was passed by unanimous vote in the Scottish Parliament last year, articulating a bold statement of our collective commitment to end child poverty in Scotland. The actions we need to turn that vision into reality were published in spring this year in Every Child, Every Chance, our first tackling child poverty delivery plan that sets out initial steps towards meeting our ambitious targets supported by a range of investments including our £50 million tackling child poverty fund. Our new social security agency, Social Security Scotland, made its first payments of carers allowance supplement in September. This investment increased the amount paid by the UK government for the carers allowance by 13%, putting an extra £442 in carers pockets. Helping our children in their earliest years will replace the Sure Start Maternity Grant with the Best Start Grant, increasing the payment to their first child and continuing payments for subsequent children unlike the UK system. And in Scotland, free school meals are available to all children in primaries one to three and for children with families on low incomes. Presiding officer, that is just some of the work we are doing to help relieve the burden of austerity from the people of Scotland. But we are not complacent and we know there is far more work to do in order to further reduce child poverty and create a more equal and fairer Scotland. And we're focused on doing more. And that is why in the forthcoming publication of our Disability Employment Action Plan, we'll set out how we work towards achieving our ambition to more than half the disability employment gap, a commitment we made in our disability delivery plan. We'll also be taking act forward actions on the gender pay gap, both areas of work being noted by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation as being potentially transformational in terms of tackling poverty. And it's why, in recognition of the fact that poverty is fundamentally about a lack of income, that we'll be working towards introducing a new income supplement to provide additional financial support for low-income families. And in terms of the heartbreaking realities facing people who are homeless or sleeping rough, We've allocated £50 million towards accelerating measures to prevent homelessness from happening in the first place. And the Homelessness Prevention and Strategy Group will set out a five-year programme to transform temporary accommodation and end rough sleeping and homelessness for good. So, presiding officer, I have set out not just a clear set of actions we're taking, but also our plans of where we need to do more and where we need to go further. Now, I think that today's debate holds us legitimately to account, but many of us will agree with where the ultimate finger of blame for the misery and pain caused through cuts and reforms should point. The UK government needs to halt universal credit. It needs to stop the austerity and instead opt to treat people across the UK with dignity, respect and provide the support that they need. I move the amendment in my name. Just before I ask you, thank you. I now call Michelle Ballantyne to speak to move amendment 14406.35 minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to open for my party in this important debate on ending poverty and equality. George Bernard Shaw said, the, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable man persists in a trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. 
If the speakers from the other benches aim today to paint the UK government and these benches as unreasonable, it probably underpins for me their unwillingness or inability to address the real drivers of poverty and inequality with the sincerity and intellectual rigour that the subject deserves. Looking at the motion submitted by Labour and the subsequent SNP amendment, one could be forgiven for thinking poverty and inequality began with the election of a Lib Dem Conservative coalition and that universal credit was devised simply to attack and punish people. In Elaine Smith's opening speech for Labour, there was no reference for the reasons universal credit was introduced and the catastrophic failure of the legacy welfare system under Labour, which showed no interest in improving our people's life chances. Well Tax credits have been hailed as the panacea by the Labour benches for the poor. But in reality, quarter of a million people never received the tax credits they were eligible for. Take the intervention. Neil Finlay. To uh, give, have an intervention on an intellectual giant such as yourself. Um, could I uh, ask the uh, member, has she had any representation from people in her constituency telling them about the outrageous situation they find themselves in with universal credit? Has she? Michelle Ballantyne. Or does she She's care? Working. Yes, but not nearly as many as you refer to, and those that I have had, I've been able to resolve. Exactly. There was no human point of contact to talk to if you had issues with tax credits. And worst of all, many people who progressed their situation and earnings then found themselves with demands to repay large chunks of the money they had been given. Hundreds of thousands of people have been driven into debt under the legacy systems. And it has meant that 60% of those coming onto universal credit are carrying that debt with them onto the new system. Labour allowed debt to spiral, both for the individual and the government. And the cost to families across the UK was a contribution that rose by nearly 3,000 a year. Labour also paid out without due diligence, opening the system to fraud. And the cost of that fraud was estimated at between 11 and 20 billion and worse still, it was hidden in the UK Treasury budget where it was not subject to audit. So actually, I am proud to be associated with a welfare change that is genuinely designed to tackle poverty and inequality. Yep. Beg your pardon, sorry, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah. Uh, I just wondered if the member says she was proud of welfare reforms. I wonder if she's proud of the two child limit and whether she's proud of the rape clause. Yeah. Michelle Ballantyne. The two-child limit is about fairness. It is fair that people on benefit cannot have as many children as they like, while people who work and pay their way and don't claim benefits have to make decisions about the number of children they can have. Fairness is fairness to everybody, not to a one part of the community. Yeah. Well Universal no, credit... No, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, Mr Finlay, I'd like to hear what the member has to say. Whether you agree with it or not, it's to be heard. Universal credit may have its flaws, but the thinking behind the system is sound, a point that has been reiterated by all those who have given evidence to this Parliament. Governments cannot dress a poverty and inequality without improving people's life chances. It is about making it work better to be in work than not to be in work. Universal credit is an evolving benefit and the rollout was implemented to allow issues to be explored and addressed. By its very nature, it is flexible with the ability to adapt. The rollout process is designed to allow checks to take place to assess if issues are policy issues or operational. And to date, they have almost wholly been operational. This means that the flaws that are there can be fixed something that could, would have been difficult under the legacy benefit system with its Byzantine processes and incomprehensible regulations. It was an important feature of UC design that a universal support system that would support the more vulnerable claimants was in place. And that is exactly what we have seen in recent weeks with the allocation of the £39 million to citizen advice to provide support with the rollout of UC, showing that the DWP recognise operational difficulties and have the confidence to address them. Regardless of what others may say, it is a fact that universal credit is working Members for the many, last as are Sorry, many UK down. government employment policies. Since 2010, youth unemployment has fallen by more than 50%. 1.1 million Britons are back in work. The number of children in workless homes has plummeted by 637,000, 
and the UK has reached a record employment rate of 75.7%, with a female employment rate of 71.3%. Yeah. All of these during one of the worst recessions of all time, and at a lower price than Labour could achieve even when the sun was shining. That's why universal credit is a key part of reducing inequality in this country, and why I will continue to lend my support to it, as should every member in this chamber. Yeah. Thank you. Well done. Thank you very much. I now call Alison Johnson to speak for the Greens. Four minutes, please, Ms Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At the start of this month, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation warned that one in four Scottish children are living in poverty. Highly regressive and aggressive cuts to our social security system are driving increased poverty, including child poverty and rapidly burgeoning food poverty. And I would like to um, inform Michelle Ballantyne that it is my view that the two-child limit is not fair, and it's certainly not fair to the third child in a family. I will not. I have four minutes. By 2020, the ongoing benefit freeze will have taken £300 million out of the pockets and the wallets of our poorest people. Perhaps most cruelly, the introduction of PIP reduces or eliminates entirely the extra cost benefit entitlement of thousands of disabled Scots. Some people have lost motiv motability vehicles as a result. They cannot get out to work. They can't visit friends and family. And all of that is before we get to universal credit, which has cut support to families despite promising not to do so. And the full horrendous impacts of this policy are yet to be seen. The Labour motion is right to call attention to the terrible impact of these reforms. But it is important to note the progress that we are making in Scotland to establish a fairer social security system, a system that offers real security to people and recognises the social bonds between us all. Now, it only covers a small part of the overall budget, but it is based on the principles of dignity and respect. And as a result of green amendments, of which we are proud, it's a system which is explicitly aimed at reducing poverty. In a system where £16 billion worth of benefits are unclaimed every year, Scotland is pursuing an income maximisation approach. Scotland is also aiming for a significant increase in the uptake of the Best Start grant, which is welcome. And Scotland has taken a stand against benefit sanctions, which no longer operate through Scottish employment schemes, another Green Manifesto commitment. But all parties in this chamber have made this a stronger social security system. All made changes to the founding legislation. So it is important to note this progress, and I do feel that the Labour motion falls short in this regard. Further, Labour are calling for an end to austerity while recklessly pursuing a jobs-first Brexit. Brexit is predicted to cause unprecedented levels of economic hardship across almost every sector and region of the UK. We absolutely must stand against austerity, as the Labour motion rightly notes. But a Tory Brexit will also hit the poorest the hardest. And nor are we content to, with, with the Conservative amendments' attempts to cover up the impact the decisions of the UK government are having on Scotland's poorest. The Scottish government are to be congratulated for taking a stand against the welfare reforms that are causing so much poverty, but it can and it must go further. The Scottish government won't use the powers available to it to apply a universal £5 top-up to child benefit, which we know will take tens of thousands of children out of relative poverty. They're too timid to allow local authorities the power to levy taxes to fund vital local services, dragging their feet even on a tourist tax. They won't look at a working workplace parking levy and a new system of local taxation has to be investigated. We need to replace the outdated and regressive council tax. If we're serious about reducing poverty in Scotland, we have some real challenges ahead of us. But our social security system is a positive step in the right direction. The Green Amendment would have kept in the motion an acknowledgement of the need to end austerity and stand against falling living standards, rising poverty and inequality, the rollout of universal credit and the damage the Tory party is wreaking on our social security system. But we can't take credibly a bid to end austerity while the party proposing it is supporting an exit from the European Union, which will also cause huge damage to those most impacted by austerity. We also want to see the Scottish Government do much more than it's already doing, take a more radical, radical stance, 
Use the powers that we now have. Mm -hmm. Enable us to do all yeah. that this Parliament can to end poverty, yes, inequality please, over and your austerity. Time. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, can I now call, please, Alec Will Hamilton? And it has to be a tight four minutes. I know you will do that, Mr. Will I will, I will, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, thank you very much. And, and by any measure, Presiding Officer, poverty has increased demonstrably since the crash of 2008. Uh, all told, uh, wage packets are 3% lower than they were in uh, 2008 and that has compa been compounded still further with the impact of Brexit, the, dev the devaluation of the pound and the incipient rising cost of living that has been a product of that calamitous decision. But poverty is not just a reduction of or absence of household income. It is manifest also in the health inequalities we debate in this place, in educational attainment and in arrested social mobility. And how we respond to that in this chamber and in the corridors of government, either in, through investment in education or in the deployment of the new welfare powers that we have at our disposal, will be the test to which we are all judged. Now, I suspect that we in this place will be mopping up, however, over, um, after the flawed delivery of welfare reforms from Westminster for many years. Now, I understand my party's role in that. I am ashamed of aspects of that role in that. But uh, the staying influence of the Liberal Democrats um, in that coalition government are now self-evident in the changes that the Conservatives have since made to things like universal credit since they have been unencumbered by our influence. And it is in the delivery of universal credit that I wanted to amend today's motion. We wanted to restate our commitment to pausing the execution and the delivery of that very flawed rollout. And that's what our amendment would have spoken to. The problems of the delivery of universal credit were very well described by Frank Field in his role as chair of the Working Pension Select Committee when he said that Wonderland visions of welfare reforms collapse on contact with real life. That's absolutely right. And those problems stem from the conflicting objectives of universal credit, which initially was pro to provide a social minimum, a, a family income, a minimum family income of simplification, of saving money and creating incentives to work. But the fact is, presiding officer, it is in the saving of money and the incentivizing of works that have taken absolute precedence over that first priority, that crucial priority of sustaining a minimum family income. And that is self-evident in the two-child limit that we have heard mentioned several times in this debate. Practical problems have also been ignored. Reasons for delay, which have been seen in the pilot rollout, have never been resolved. Unintended penalties for self-employed people have not been overcome. And we're still using single bank accounts for divided families and those who are affected by domestic abuse where finances can be used as a tool of coercive control. The list goes on and it is a, a, an embarrassing litany of failure. So the conclusion of the uh, Work and Pension Select Committee, and I agree with them, is that robust safeguards must be in place to stop family income falling still further. I absolutely agree with that. And since we left, left office, the measure of the Tory assault on those families dependent on it has been laid bare. A total of three billion pounds has now been slashed from the work allowance and the taper where recipients keep a larger proportion of their money before benefit cut, benefits are cut has been hacked to pieces. As has, and as was foretold by my colleague Stephen Lloyd when he sat on the Work and Pension Select Committee, um, that we are starting to see in those families who are already in receipt of the housing benefit component of universal credit being paid directly to landlords, uh, not be, no longer being paid directly to landlords, that a half of those are uh, see um, rent arrears of a month behind or more. And this is why we need a pause. We need to understand the problems as we have identified many times. We are just at the threshold of this rollout, presiding officer, and I'll conclude by saying that this yes, winter... Yes, no, you're just concluding. I will. Thank this you. This winter, many of our constituents spoil face this. Your, so spoiled your track record, but never support. mind. I'll forgive you. <laughs> Ali, the speeches are four minutes now in the open debate. It's Alec Rowley, followed by Tom Arthur. Mr Rowley. Thank you, presiding officer. I uh, welcome the fact that Elaine Smith has brought forward this motion today and we're having this discussion. And I would rather focus or try to focus on where we can agree rather than where we disagree. Um, and in terms of the, the motions and amendments, you know, I accept that the SNP are not going to accept Labour's premise that, that more can be done. On the other hand, we can agree and we need to have this debate in communities across Scotland 
that fundamentally the failure of austerity, needless austerity, and, and as Eileen Campbell says, the ideologically driven austerity sits at the root of the growing poverty, deprivation and inequality that we see in Scotland, and it has halted the progress that was being made over generations by a number of political parties to try and tackle the deep-rooted deprivation that exists in far too many of communities up and down Scotland. And the Conservative Party are in complete denial where they then attack the fact that, that tax credits, for example, under the last Labour government lifted over a million children across Britain out of poverty, 200 children in Scotland, 200,000 children in Scotland out of poverty. So, so that is to be complete denial. In 2010, when, when the, the Conservative Liberal Coalition was elected, I wasn't aware that there were any food banks locally in Fife. Now there are food banks in near enough every community up and down Scotland. So that is the evidence that as a direct result of conservative policy, conservative policy supported by the party over there, that we have this unacceptable level of poverty, deprivation and inequality in Scotland that should galvanise the rest of us to look at where we can agree and where we can work together and have that debate across Scotland so people know what the real consequences of voting Conservative is and are. Can, yeah. Michelle Ballantyne. Is the member arguing that the legacy systems as they existed should be returned to? Alec Rowley. I'm saying that as a direct result of tax credits that, that a million children across the United Kingdom was lifted out of poverty. You know, one thing I would say in terms of the, the SNP motion here, the SNP, or amendment, the SNP state that they have included certain targets to eradicate child poverty. Let's not forget, it was the Conservative Party who removed the targets for tackling child poverty once they came into power, because they, know, they knew that as a direct result of their policies, more and more children in Scotland and across the United Kingdom were being driven into poverty, and we should stand up against that. It is unacceptable in this day and age that that be the case. But could I say, I, I have argued for some time that what we need in Scotland is a national poverty strategy. And, you know, the Poverty Alliance set out a whole number of areas. Now, Labour has put forward that we believe increasing child benefit by £5 a week would have an impact lifting immediately 30,000 children out of poverty, benefiting half a million children. The SNP government look at the options in terms of further top-ups and more targeting it. Let's have that discussion. Let's enter into a discussion because our concern would be that an income supplement would be bureaucratic I'm, and perhaps cost more money. So in all these areas, yeah, no, let's um, look at where, let's look at where debate, we can no, work must, together to tackle poverty conclude. in Scotland. You must conclude. If, if you select short debates, then it's brutal, but we have to have four minute speeches to the nail. Tom Arthur followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate. Uh, debating poverty, debating inequality is one of our fundamental duties in this place. It is a debate which taxes us intellectually because of how challenging an area is, but it's also a debate which taxes us emotionally because each and every one of us in our role representing our constituencies and regions will have had come face to face with people who have been at the sharp end of Tory austerity and have had their lives, in some cases, utterly destroyed and shaken as a consequence of their engagement with the welfare system. Now, I want to recognise the uh, motion that Labour have brought forward. Unfortunately, I can't support it because of one line in it, essentially, which states that 
the Scottish Government have failed to use the devolved powers adequately. adequately. Now, I'm happy to always argue for, for more powers to be used, for more powers to come to this Parliament and for new and innovative ways of using these powers. But this Parliament and this Government has delivered in a lot of areas, be it on the 2030 targets on child poverty, full mitigation of the bedroom tax, launching the carers supplement, extending access to free sanitary uh, products, the Homeless and Rough Sleepers Action Group, commitments to impl implement and recognise all the recommendations, increasing the Fair Food Fund, setting up Social Security Scotland, using the income tax powers progressively to offset cuts from the UK Government, the pupil equity fund, £750 million committed towards closing the attainment gap, increasing provision of free childcare is up to 30 years by the end of this Parliament, a commitment to the, Scottish living, uh, to the real living wage for all Scottish Government employees since 2011, the new Best Start grant coming on imminently, and the Baby Box as well. These are a range of other areas, and where we don't have the powers over employment law, we are taking strong steps, such as with the Scottish Business Pledge, and also Carer Positive, a great scheme that I would encourage all MSPs to sign up to, and to become Carer Positive employers, and to send a message out if let me just finish this one point and to send a message out to all of those businesses and employers in your own constituency and region that they too can become care of positive employers. I'll give way to the member. Elaine Smith. I thank the member for giving way and of course um, much of that has to be applauded and supported but also over that time the SNP has passed on Tory austerity to councils with the cuts of 1.5 billion stripped out of their budget since 2011. Mr Arthur, Mr Arthur. I thank the member for intervention. This actually comes to a real <coughs> fundamental point in, in crux in this debate because fundamentally it comes down to two views of what this parliament is for. There's a view of the Labour Party which is it's a buffer. Alex Cole Hamilton spoke about, that, spoke about this parliament having to mop up the consequences of Tory welfare reforms. Now that's a, a view and a philosophy that the Labour Party are entitled to. But it's not the view I have, because I don't want to have to be the parliament that mitigates. I want to be the parliament where all of the powers are in this parliament, powers over employment law, so we can make sure there is a real living wage, and under 25s aren't being paid the poverty national minimum wage. I want to have the full range of powers so we can truly transform Scotland. And I want the full powers so we don't, have a, we don't live in a country where colleagues of Michelle Ballantyne get to dictate social security policy in this country. Because I have to say, in my two and a half years in this parliament, the contribution from Michelle Ballantyne was one of the most disgraceful speeches I have ever heard. Six minutes of pompous Victorian moralising that would have been better suited to the pages of a Dickens novel and to suggest that poverty should be a barrier to a family, that people who are poor are not entitled to any more than two children. What an absolutely disgraceful position and she should be utterly, utterly ashamed of herself. Thank you. I call Tom, I call Jeremy Balford to be followed by James Dornan. Mr Balford, please. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. Um, inequality comes in many different forms, and some of it we have already uh, discussed, um, sometimes loudly and sometimes softly, already this afternoon. Uh, one area that I want to pick up in my brief time is that around education and early years. Uh, this is an issue that clearly has been devolved to the Scottish Parliament, to the Scottish Government, since the Parliament started. And I think it would be interesting to review where we have come in the last 25 years, or perhaps to say how little we have come in the last 25 years. Because what we have seen through different political parties and different policies is the attainment gap growing wider and wider uh, for those who come from the most disadvantaged parts of our society. Now, I think one of the advantages of being a member of this parliament is that you get to meet interesting individuals, interesting groups, and you learn lots. I think the one thing that I had been un unaware of, to be honest, until two and a half years ago, was the importance of the first three years in a child's life. That those three years will often set the direction of where that child will go. And the simple answer is that we are failing far too many of our children at that age. Too many are not getting the opportunities that they deserve or require. And until we can tackle that issue, the attainment gap will never go down 
and the attainment gap will more likely grow larger and larger. What we need to do is work out what is working and then do that as good practice. I would point to organisations within my region, such as Dad's Rock, which are going in and trying to offer uh, fathers um, of all ages how to parent, um, how to bring up their children, and to give them the techniques that they lack. We do that by not simply sitting down, giving academic discussions, but on a regular basis, bring together fathers and their children and teach them how to play and the benefits of play. Now, so for some of us, that will seem very obvious. But actually, to learn these techniques, to show us how we can encourage our children to read, to sing, to talk at that early age, will set them up for an education later on in life. If we carry on at the speed that this government is setting, it will be 40 years, presiding officer, 40 years before the attainment gap is brought to zero. That will be several generations who have been failed again by this parliament and by this government. And we can talk about other inequalities, we can talk about other disadvantages, but unless we tackle the people who have been born into our society now, then simply nothing will change. We need to support the third sector, we need to support those on frontline services to make sure that they are given the appropriate resources to be able to do that work. We can have all the warm words or shout as much as we want from different parts of this chamber, but the root cause is clear. We are failing our generations of younger children. We've done it for 25 years, we're still doing it, and until we change that, nothing will change. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thank you. I call James Dornan to be followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I just say before I start that if Alec Rowley had written the motion and made the opening speech, then I think my speech would have been much different. His was a much more sensible tone. It was putting the blame where it lies, and it was talking about being able to work together to try and solve the problems. Unfortunately, what we get from the Labour motion and what we got from Elaine Smith's speech as the usual, we'll, we'll touch on the Tory party, say that they are to blame for the general thing, and then have a go at all the shortcomings that she sees in the SNP without acknowledging at all all the work that the SNP has done, that the Scottish Government has done to mitigate the problems that have came from Westminster and came from that Tory party. Now, this is not unusual. Every time that the Labour Party comes into this chamber with a motion, all they do is play politics. That's all they do. All they do is play politics. No, I can't. I've only got four minutes, Neil. I always like to take you. I've only got four minutes. I'm really sorry. You know, well, you're, you know why should we be surprised by this? I mean, you, you're a party that has done nothing. We're the only party that's done anything to mitigate the, the effects of the Westminster decisions. You're the party who campaigned to make sure that Westminster stayed in charge of us, despite the fact that it was likely to be the Tories. You're the party who abstained when welfare cuts came, in, came to Westminster, which meant that we were in the situation that we were in the now. And then when you were given the opportunity to get those powers devolved to this, party, eh, to this parliament, you were the party that said no. Now, th it, there's nothing in your history, recent history, that suggests anything but contempt for this parliament. I'm sorry, it's just not. Why, and why should we be surprised by this? Because everything is about opportunism. We saw it last week. We saw a party who had the goal to throw millions of pounds to keep women in their place and then have the goal to try to pretend to people that they're the champions of those exact same women. Led by the same union, the GMB, of which their present leader, Richard Leonard, was a highly placed official at the time, who came for, to the agreement to sacrifice women's rights to protect their male workers. That doesn't sound like for the many to me. And now, I don't mention this to have a go at the strikers, because they were, under, I understand their frustration, they're fully entitled to go on strike, but the stink of hypocrisy from the Labour Party last week was quite something. No, this week it was, sorry. And please don't tell me it'll be all right when Jeremy's number 10, because that's just not going to happen. There's more chance of me eventually taking over for Bruni in the centre of Celtic's midfield than there is of him becoming Prime Minister. Time yeah, just look at the opinion polls now. They don't have, tend to have a great record, and I accept that. But when poll after poll shows him 
behind the worst PM in living memory, he's got no chance. And you know, for any serious party to want to change things in this Parliament, there's a process which allows every party, every party, to put forward their proposals for a better Scotland and to combat austerity. And it's called the budget. Last time we'd won, the government and other parties took that opportunity to work together to produce a budget which would best serve everyone. Labour's contribution is here for all to see. Nothing. They decided their role of capping from the sidelines and trying to steal credit for other people's work they clearly didn't need to do was enough for them. Presiding officer, that's why I find this motion from Labour both distasteful and hypocritical. And I wish I could remember the last time Labour contributed something positive to the chamber. But I've only been in this parliament in different guises since 2007, so unfortunately I can't. Please defeat this motion and treat it with the contempt it deserves. Thank you. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Brian Whittle. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> presiding officer. How would you follow that? Um, can I thank uh, Labour for bringing this uh, topic to the chamber? And I'm going to focus my short time specifically uh, on health inequality. Um, I know we've all seen the diagram of the Glasgow Underground, where within that uh, two-mile radius, life expectancy varies by a staggering 16.9 years, depending on which vicinity station that you actually live in. So I would start by saying that the very basis uh, of any health agenda is rooted uh, in good nutrition and being physically active and inclusivity. I would also suggest there are very few conditions that cannot be positively affected by improving these. And if we follow this argument, it, it then leads us to that ease of access to an, an understanding of uh, good nutrition and physical activity and the environment in which uh, this takes place. So I think the health conversation uh, has got to change because there are many levers available to the Scottish Government that would not require huge budgetary commitments, but which have a significant long-term impact on the health of our nation. The educational environment should be a key battleground in delivering a healthier future for Scotland, uh, from that nursery to, to higher education, and closing that health inequality gap. So when we're considering physical and nutritional education, we need to look at not only at the learning environment, but how we ensure this learning can be implied outside of the school timetable. It's not enough to learn the theory. Uh, pupils must be given the opportunity to apply that learning in practice. And looking outside to the environment adjacent to schools, I think we need to look at the planning department and be cognizant of where licenses for things like fast food restaurants and the like are granted. Look at the preventing food vans from being parked close to schools and also consider at what age uh, we should allow our children uh, to leave the school premises. Because, see, I've got no problem with, with fast food. I do, however, have a huge issue when it becomes the staple diet. And there are generally more fast food outlets, gambling outlets, and access to alcohol in the more deprived areas per capita than in the more affluent areas. Whatever the child's background is, in my view, if you're able to make a positive impact, we have a duty to do so. That whole start, as, as Jeremy Balfour was talking about, they're starting with that active play framework in nursery, along with that good basic nutrition. This early intervention directly tackles the situation where children are reaching primary school age uh, behind. No, I won't uh, take school age uh, already two years behind in their learning. I think that the, the attainment and ultimately productivity is the significant subplot uh, uh, of successfully tackling health inequality and doing so we open up more opportunity to more of the population. What the Scottish Government have failed to recognise is that many of the nation's health issues are best tackled in the education portfolio. Therefore, if we're truly serious about tackling health inequality, a long-term cross-portfolio strategy has to be implemented. Anything less, and the Scottish Government is not developing that long-term strategy of sustainability, they're just merely managing its demise. And I have to say, the Labour motion, quite frankly, is a hodgepodge of cobbled together notions devoid of any original thought or idea. It's designed to be able to try and attack both Scottish and UK governments on a very superficial level. And I think they are desperately grappling for some kind of foothold. In fact, it's really poor fare. And as for the SNP, as long as they can blame someone else, they won't have to take any action themselves. They tinker around the edge and look for headlines instead of actually being brave enough to make the big changes that would actually make the big differences. Deputy Presiding Officer, there is huge inequality in this country. Of that, there is no doubt. There are solutions available if the powers that be are resolute and brave enough to take the bull by the horns and make the change. From what we have heard today from a very tired Labour Party and entrenched SNP government, the solutions do not sit with them. 
Education is the solution to health and welfare. It should be the SNP government's priority, but we know for sure their focus is somewhere else. Presiding officer. Thank you. I call Polly McNeill before we move to closing speeches. The Universal Credit Project is in crisis. It has been universally condemned. It has fatal design flaws. It is hugely underfunded. And it is hurting the poorest and the most vulnerable people in our society. Don't take my word for it. The fact that it is underfunded and is hurting people is the admission of Secretary Esther McVeigh, who contradicted Downing Street by saying so, that families would be worse off. Do the Scottish Tories not know this? John Major, your former Prime Minister, has said it will be your poll tax moment. I would suggest that the benches on the other side, who have consistently defended this, might want to think ahead a little bit about how universally condemned the system is. The facts are, even Heidi Allen MP says it's a question of morality. But let's even look to the facts. Resolution Foundation suggests that overall universal credit is set to lose £3 billion across the system. That it replaces the legacy benefits referred to. It will leave families on average £600 or more worse off a year and single parents even worse off at around £1,300. The worst element of this universal credit system is the two-child limit, the most draconian element of the reforms. And to say this to Michelle Bannantyne, you say that parents should think about how many children they should have. Why should any policy ask the children to pay the price of that? Universal credit is not even fully rolled out yet. It is a system that promised, promised to change the face of the welfare system using benefits to encourage people to work. And yes, there have been some positive outcomes. But overall, universal credit has been a key factor pushing people into poverty and widening the inequality gap. And it just doesn't end there. It is a problem for many people and women in particular in abusive or coerced relationships. The tax credit and child system that Alec Rowley talked about did lift tens of thousands of children out of poverty. But this group of parents who have not previously been subject to conditionality will now have conditionality, conditionality attached to that element of universal credit. They will be poorer under this system and it will undo the work of the last Labour government under Gordon Brown in reducing child poverty. Even the Office of Budget Responsibility estimates that the full rollout of universal credit will affect at least a third of working households. And even back then, when tax credits were floated by Labour, women MPs quickly saw that the Treasury plan would cause problems because a credit system means that it's generally paid to the main earners who are usually men. So that's why child tax credits were brought in addition to that, to make sure that mostly women would have some control over their families' finances. So abusive relationships is a subject that we've discussed in this parliament because the reason why it's a problem is it's paid into one person's uh, or a couple's bank account. For example, if one partner in a two-income household receives a bonus, universal credit treats this as a joint income and adjust payment accordingly. However, there have been issues and cases where one partner refused to share the bonus that they earned. You can see the impact particularly on women. In the end, universal credit, not as Ian Duncan Smith claimed it would do, it does not increase fairness and it certainly does not increase simplicity. Women's Aid and the TUC notice that 52% of survivors living with, their living with their abusers said that financial abuse had prevented them from leaving their relationships. Universal credit is pushing people into poverty. It is creating the deepest social problems. We must scrap it now until we can make absolutely fundamental reforms to do what it was meant to do. Thank you very much. We move now to closing speeches and I call on Morris Golden to close for the Conservative Party. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the Labour's motion today that draws attention to the problem of poverty, but it is a missed opportunity. Instead of taking an honest look at the complex and deep-seated problems that underlie the recent decline in life expectancy, 
their motion is more concerned with scoring political points. There is agreement across the chamber. Elaine Smith and Aileen Campbell uh, have said that it's not acceptable that persistent and deep-rooted poverty and inequality persists. And that's a point I think we can all agree with across the chamber. Michelle Ballantyne highlighted that universal credit is a better, modern benefit that replaces an old system that disincentivised work. Neil Findlay. Neil Findlay. Mr Golden mentioned uh, Michelle Ballantyne. Will he apologise on behalf of his party for the utterly shameful comments yeah, made absolutely. about people who are on benefits that they cannot have more than two children? Will she yeah. apologise for that shameful <laughs> comment? Maurice Golden. Uh, the only thing shameful in this chamber is the remarks from Mr Findlay. I completely agree with Michelle Ballantyne and her uh, case where she highlighted that universal credit will mean that 700,000 more people getting the extra money that they are entitled to and one million more disabled households are getting more uh, money per month and in fact 83% of claimants uh, are satisfied with the system and indeed the rollout. So, uh, Jeremy Balfour, in addition, spoke about the need to get it right for the youngest in society, particularly those under three years old. And Brian Whittle spoke about how we must tackle health inequality. But focusing on the motion, the steady rise in life expectancy we have seen in recent decades is to be celebrated. It is a clear sign of the advance we, as a country, have made in improving living standards and ensuring the next generation fares better than the last. It is for that reason that the recent decline in life expectancy is so concerning. Our children must be able to look forward to a bright, healthy and prosperous future, not a state of decline. Any drop in life expectancy should be a wake-up call to whatever party is in government. And I genuinely hope that the SNP are up for this challenge. Unfortunately, their record in government gives little reassurance of that. The gap in educational attainment and missed healthcare treatment targets, which they just yesterday admitted will continue to be missed for at least three more years, are evidence of that. More than ever, Scotland needs a parliament that will be tackling poverty as a key priority. We have the appalling situation in Scotland where one quarter of children live in poverty. For too long, Scotland has been let down. And after all the years Labour dominated Scottish politics, Glasgow is still plagued by deprivation. The SNP are no better, shirking responsibility by trying to blame the UK government for their failings, but on SNP's watch, Homelessness has risen for the first time in eight years. So we need to work together in areas of common ground. We all recognise that ending poverty is a challenge that we need to drive up standards. And ultimately, I and my party are up for tackling poverty, for tackling inequality, and I would like to see that from across the chamber as well. Thank you. I call the Cabinet Secretary to wind up for the Government. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And it has been a, a passionate debate today, and rightly so, as I said in my opening remarks. It is unacceptable that in what is a rich and prosperous country like Scotland, there continues to be such persistent and deep-rooted inequalities. And I think Alec Cole Hamilton was absolutely right, right to point out the far-reaching impact of poverty and inequality affecting life chances, educational attainment, and in health and well-being. The key, therefore, is to enable people to have their fair chance to flourish, and it is to tackle this deep-seated uh, inequality and poverty. And as Alison Johnson said, be imaginative and cross-cutting in our approach to interrogate where we more needs to be done. 
So, presiding officer, while the debate was passionate, there was areas of agreement. And to be honest, if you are living in poverty, if you are reliant on food banks, then the very least you can expect uh, that you have a right to see your elected representatives work together to find solutions in spite of the punitive acts of the UK government. Now, all bar one party in this parliament recognised the brutal impact of universal credit. The impact that sees universal claimants being six times as likely to be sanctioned as claimants of any other legacy uh, payment or that sees 3,800 Scottish families have their incomes reduced to the two-child limit. Pauline McNeill is also right that it is hurting uh, people and it is morally, uh, its morality is questionable. And Tom Arthur was also correct to get angry and call out the Conservatives moralising that seem to suggest that if you're poor, you're not allowed any more than two children. That view is utterly, utterly reprehensible. Now, I, I, don't, I am quite willing to go back to the, uh, the OR tomorrow. However, I do think, and I think we all heard, that there was a suggestion that if you are poor, that you do not deserve any more than two children. Uh, and I think uh, that is something that we need to call out because it is not right it is not right what uh, Michelle Ballantyne made. Now, if she didn't mean that, then fair enough. However, I do think it showed uh, a slight, a, a, a showed us a, a, just a glimpse of uh, the Conservatives and their true uh, reasons for pursuing uh, these policies. That is, that is why, though, the UK government must halt the rollout of universal credit and the Conservatives here must face up to the impact of the ideologically driven welfare reforms their party uh, is taking forward. The impact that includes food banks, two-child limit, rape clause, the gendered impact of poverty as outlined by Paul McNeill. That is not a system that I would ever associate with any sort of pride. That was a pride that I think Al Michelle Ballantyne mentioned, so I'm happy to take an intervention if she wants to tell us how proud she is of that system. Michelle Ballantyne. Well, your sarcasm does you no credit. The, the, issue here, the issue here is fundamentally whether you are saying or you are suggesting that the legacy benefits that existed before universal credit is something you want to go back to, whether you fundamentally disagree with the principle of universal credit on whether you are willing to work out and make sure that we iron out the flaws as we roll it out and make it work. Cabinet Secretary. This, I do not want to tolerate the brutal impact that universal credit is having in the here and now. And if the Tories don't want to face up to the fact that their decisions are having that impact here and now and that they won't cut it, halt it, then I think you do a disservice to the system you're trying to articulate is in place because it's not the reality of what people are experiencing in their daily lives. The food banks are a reality. The two-child limit is a reality. The rape clause is a reality. And you need to face up to the fact that it's your party that is per perpetrating and peddling that misery on people in the here and now. Could I ask all colleagues to speak now, through the chair, Alison please? Johnson also talked about the establishment of Scotland's new social security system and how this parliament worked together to ensure that what emerged from the legislation was a system based on dignity and respect, giving just a glimpse of what is possible when we have the chance and the powers to shape and hone an approach that seeks to make a positive impact to people's lives, supporting people and not stigmatising them. And Alec Rowley, I think, was absolutely right to point out how the progress that has been made in terms of tackling poverty, whether by the previous Labour Liberal Executive or through the measures that I outlined in my opening remarks that we have taken forward, has been halted by the Conservatives and that they are absolutely and continue to be in denial about that. And I also recognise that we need to do more. If we want to make good on our ambition to make Scotland the best place to grow up, then we need to do more uh, than our plans to go uh, that we currently have to the, uh, suggest a £12 million of fund to support parents and to work and develop their skills, a £7.5 million innovation fund to support new approaches to preventing and reducing child poverty, and a whole list of other actions that we are taking forward to eradicate child poverty. We are committed to doing more, and that is why, in recognition that poverty is fundamentally about a lack of income, our Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan commits us to work towards introducing a new income supplement to provide additional financial support for low-income families. And I was really pleased to hear Alec Rowley's uh, offer to work together, to work out where we can find agreement, to work in collaboration, recognising that I think a lot of what has been said today is agreement that the Tories are perpetrating misery on our society 
society and that we need to respond to that in a way that is uh, responsible. And so I welcome his uh, commitment to work with us to work out what more we can do in a reasonable way and I look forward to working him and welcome him to his new post uh, and certainly want to continue to work with other parties because I think together, all bar one party, we are in agreement that this country needs to move forward and we need to help children have their fair chance to flourish. Thank you. And I call David Stewart to conclude the debate for the Labour Party. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And there can be few more important topics for debate than one that aims to end austerity, poverty and inequality. Understandably, the debate was passionate. It was mostly well-informed and occasionally animated about poverty and deprivation. And as Richard Lakey once said, today we stand with the brains of hunter-gatherers in our heads, looking out on a modern world made comfortable by some by the fruits of human inventiveness and made miserable for others by the scandal of deprivation in the midst of plenty. Now, President Officer, you don't need to look far to find evidence for Richard Leckie's powerful comments in the human condition in Scotland, and many speakers have mentioned this. In each year between 2014 and 17, one million people in Scotland were living in poverty. 8% of people are in persistent poverty. The poverty rates, as Elaine Smith said, for single adult women were higher than for single adult men. Particular worries about minority ethnic groups, poverty being higher than white ethnic groups, and relative pensioner poverty is also a major issue. Elaine, said, Elaine Smith said that no one in 21st century Scotland should have to live in poverty. She said it's simply unacceptable that one in five people and one in four children are forced to live in poverty. Now, many speakers today, such as Alec Rowley, Pauline McNeill, Alan Cole Hamilton and Brian Whittle, mentioned health inequalities where the poor die younger than the affluent. Now, we know, President Officer, that poverty, social deprivation and inequality are significant contributors to poor, poor health expectations. And it's the least well-off who are most at risk. Now, back in 1948, the NHS represented the advance of egalitarianism in our nation. There was great hope for the new future that it heralded. Now, a Guardian news article at the time said that the health service was designed to offset, as far as they can, the inequalities that arise from chances in life, to ensure that a bad start or a stroke of bad luck, often crippling economic penalty it had in the past, should be changed. So inequality in health is fundamental to this debate. But we know that life expectancy in the UK has stalled. And in the last 50 years, the chasm between the health outcomes of the rich and the poor has widened. Is it not, presiding officer, for those that can listen, an outrage that in the 21st century society, individuals' health expectations are intrinsically linked uh, to their postcode? But I believe that inequalities are just a symptom of the problem. We've got to look at the wider issues. And in the brief time available, and I can't apologise, I can't mention all the speakers, I would make the final few comments, presiding officer, that the greatest enemy we face is not some distant foe hiding in foreign fields, but it's here today and every day in Scotland hiding in plain sight. It's poverty, it's discrimination, it's inequality, it's ignorance and it's want. Different creatures in size and scale to the five giants of the Beveridge Report of 1942, but the same route, too many people living below the poverty line, the poor are dying younger than the affluent, a dysfunctional and adequate system of welfare protection, a postcode lottery of health care. The root cause is a fundamental inequality of power, rights and wealth in society. And we slay the five giants only when we win the battle against austerity and the war against inequality. All we need is the will to do and the soul to dare. Thank you, and that concludes our debate on ending austerity, poverty and inequality. Next item of business is consideration of business motion 14427 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out our business programme. Uh, and I call on Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move the motion. Thank you very much. I call... Uh, no members asked to speak against the motion, sorry. So the question is that motion 14427 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The next item is consideration of business motion 14428 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau on a stage two timetable for a bill. I call on Graham Day to move the motion. Move, presiding officer. I would ask if any member wishes to speak against the motion. Yes. No one does. Therefore, the question is that motion 14428 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. 
The next item is consideration of three parliamentary bureau motions. Could I ask Graham Day on behalf of the bureau to move motions 1429 to 1431 on approval of SSIs? Thank you. We turn now to decision time. The first question is that amendment 1405.1 in the name of Claire Hockey, which seeks to amend motion 14405 in the name of Richard Leonard on keep the Monklands in Monklands be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 14405.1 in the name of Claire Hockey is yes, 94, no, 26. There were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore agreed. So the next question is that motion 14405 in the name of Richard Leonard as amended on keep the Monklands and Monklands be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. No, we're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. Thank you. The result of the vote on motion 14405 in the name of Richard Leonard as amended is yes 98, no 21. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Aileen Campbell is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Michelle Ballantyne will fall. The next question is that amendment 14406.4 in the name of Aileen Campbell, which seeks to amend the motion 14406 in the name of Elaine Smith, on ending austerity, poverty and inequality be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 14406.4 in the name of Aileen Campbell is yes, 61, no, 59. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The amendment in the name of Michelle Ballantyne falls. And therefore, the next question is that motion 14406 in the name of Aileen Smith as amended on ending austerity, poverty and inequality be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. And members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 14406 in the name of Elaine Smith as amended is yes, 66, no, 54. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. I would finally propose to ask a single question on three parliamentary bureau motions. Does any member object? Please say so now. Good. 
The question is that motions 1429 to 1431 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move shortly to members' business in the name of Angela Constance on support for families of loved ones killed abroad. We'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats.